Okay, okay. We do film these um, preachers on a Sunday morning, so if you miss it, or you want to question what I say, then uh, go look at it on YouTube and uh, have a look, and of course share it. So we're continuing our series on James. Now you must be wondering, how many has Tim preached so far on James? It's 14, and I started in February 2022. So let's turn to the book of James, or the letter of James. And we've come right to the end of it. This is the last one. Is there any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anybody happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of our Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sin to each other and pray with each other so you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced crop. My brothers, if one of you should be wandering from the truth, and somebody would bring him back, remember this. Whoever who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over multitude of sins. James has been given us very practical advice in his epistle. It's a great discipleship letter. And here in the very last passage, he doesn't disappoint. He gives instructions for life's ups and downs. Perhaps the movie or Hollywood and the media, and maybe even friends that you know, may try to display life without its struggles. Friends, the reality is that life is very much like a roller coaster. We have our ups and our downs. We saw in the last passage that I preached last week that James encourages us to be patient, especially with regards to the coming of the Lord. We are to have patience, to cultivate that virtue of patience throughout our lives. But patience isn't the whole story. Patience tells us not to be angry or upset. But we could also use some positive advice on what to do instead. James now produces that advice. Or really, it's greater than advice. It is a command to all believers in Jesus. Four particular situations in life. These situations may not cover everything, but they do cover quite a lot. And if you remember, James specifies these in questions. Number one, is there any among you suffering? Is there any among, among you who are cheerful? Is there among any of you who are sick? And what you do if somebody's wandering from the faith. James gives us instructions for what every Christian should do in each of these situations 
in which we find ourselves as we walk our Christian life. For indeed, it is a roller coaster. You may be familiar with Ecclesiastes 3, where there's a time for everything. This is what Solomon wrote. So there's time for suffering. There's time for cheerfulness. There's time for sickness. And there's time for wandering away from the faith. These are prone to happen to us Christians, but we don't have to take it without any response. We are to respond in the way that James specifies. Let's look at them one by one. In each case, you will note what are we to do and what the law does. We take that first one, suffering. There's a lot about suffering by persecution in the scriptures, particularly because we're believers in the Jewish Messiah, that the scriptures are clear about the suffering through persecution. But here we're looking at suffering in the broader aspect. Yes, we suffer because you're a Christian, but we also suffer because we live in a fallen world. We feel the effects of sin. And when we're suffering, perhaps we feel helpless. Things are out of control. Are we helpless? No, we're not helpless. What can we do? We can pray. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Church, let us never underestimate the power of prayer. The Lord has called us to pray and promises to work through prayer. Prayer is basically speaking to God. So prayer is what we do when we're suffering. This contrasts drastically to what the response that the world would give us today. There is a tendency in our world to respond to suffering with claims of injustice, blaming other people for our problems, and looking for a handout to alleviate our problems. I feel a lot better when I've got a bunch of cash in my hand. You see the problem, the world relies on government, not on God. But when the government provides something, they must take it from somebody else. They don't generate wealth, they transfer it. But God is the creator of all things and gives generously to those who ask. Suffering comes in a variety of forms. It's not only physical, but it could be mental, emotional, and financial. In any case, James is very clear, we are to pray to God. Suffering is one of the downs in life. But next, James talks about an up, the up of cheerfulness. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing. When you were sing, cheerful, sing praises. Sing or say good things about the Lord. Again, we draw to God. In the low, we pray. In the high, we praise. We are not to direct cheerfulness to the circumstances that we're in, or to the object that has made us cheerful. But we are to respond in thanks and praise to our Father God. We are to worship him. We are to worship the creator, not the created. So when we're happy, perhaps 
a new car, don't dwell on the motor, but dwell on God and his grace. Thank the Lord, praise his name, and we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. All blessings, all things come from our Father God. We are to sing his praises. See, singing praises is not an option for Christians. We are instructed that we receive God's word and it grows to be natural for us. Yet singing can be hard at first, especially singing at home with your family or praising God with no limits. We are to sing his praises in church and in the home and wherever you can do so. Singing praise to God has two purposes in Scripture. To instruct us and to praise. 1 Colossians 3.16 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching you and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our heart to God. This is why it's important for our hymns and songs have a biblical content which we are so on the ball in this church for that. Everything that we sing and I commend the worship team when they choose the songs they are particular about this. With the songs we can learn from them. It's a bit difficult to learn from just music. But God and his ways, these words that we sing are so important. We want to get it into our heads. Do you ever get a song that just keeps on repeating? I was talking to Eve on this week. At Christmas, somebody at her work started singing Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Batman Smells, Robin Flew Away. And she was singing it a whole of Christmas, doing my head in, because it's stuck in her head. And somebody in the congregation repeated it, which compounded. So this is what we want, these songs based in Scripture to get stuck in our head. So James goes on to say, is anybody who is cheerful, let him sing praises. Do we sing? Do we praise? Do we honor and worship God in words set to music to show our appreciation to God for what he has done? Hallelujah, I believe we do. Now James roller coaster takes a nosedive. So we have suffering, then we have cheerfulness, now we have sickness. What is a Christian to do when he is sick, when he is seriously sick? James tells us in verse 14, is anybody among you sick? Let him call the elders and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of our Lord Jesus. Like suffering, this is a down. It also calls for us to pray. But now it is a prayer of the elders of the church. This tells me a number of things. The importance of membership in a church. If you're a believer in Jesus who is sick, you're supposed to call on the elders of the church. But if you don't have elders because you don't belong to a church, how are you going to fulfill the scripture that James has instructed us? It is critical that we are to be part of a church or you're out of accord with this scripture and other biblical commands. Note that the elder is plural. 
The church is not run by a dictator. There are elders. There's more than one. And we see something of the role of the elders and their importance. There are other tasks that elders do. But here, we find that they pray for the serious ill. The sick person is not sending for a single person, some faith healer, but for faithful man of men of God, the elders in the community of faith, the church. That is why they may pray to God for healing, for all blessings flow, flow from the Lord, even healing. We see that prayer is powerful. Verse 15 says this, the power of prayer will save one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he com committed sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous man has great power as it, as it is working. Elijah was a man like the nature of ours and he prayed fervently that it may not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore fruit. We must understand, however, all prayer is subject to the will of God. It says, and this is the confidence that you have towards him, that if you ask anything accordingly to his will, he will hear us. So not all our prayers are answered. I was always taught there's three answers when you pray. And the Lord will say, yes, no, wait. You remember that Paul prayed for relief from the thorn in his side. But the Lord, for his reason, did not relieve Paul of that suffering. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through uh, 7 through to 9, it says this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given to me, a message of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it, should not, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. As a church universal, we need to take that on board. We need to understand the theology of suffering. We move on to the fourth part of what James has been saying to the church. The last down, as it were, has to do with wandering. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wander from the truth and somebody brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. While in the other cases of down, when we take a nosedive, the person is to pray or to call for prayer. Here, those who have wandered away from the Lord and so are not praying, therefore another person needs to intervene. It doesn't tell us how we are to intervene, but we're to do it anyway. This could be with prayer. This could be 
comforting this person, listening to them, challenging them with the word of God. We must work to bring them back. In this, like all the downs in life, there are things we are to do and there are things that God does. God hears our prayer. God answers our prayer. God heals the sick and God will bring back the lost sheep. But he has so designed this world that he does it alongside us. I can barely get my head around that. That God encourage us to be part of his movement amongst mankind. God can certainly do all these things without us, but he calls us to prayer. He calls to go after those who are wandering. We are part of his plan, church. Our lives are not meaningless but integral to God's world and overall plan for all things. And if we do mess up and we don't do our part, God does. God is faithful and just to bring about his purposes. He is faithful to his covenant promises. Let us then follow his instruction. Pray to him. Trust that he works all things together for good for those who are called according, according to his promises. Church, is that not good news this morning? Does that bring joy to your heart? Hallelujah, it certainly does to me. That whatever I do in my life, the way I live my Christian life, being centered on Jesus is the whole of the letter of James has been saying to become Christ-like, to walk in the way that Halakha walk, that, that straight path that he sets our feet on. And prayer is key. We meet for prayer tomorrow night here at 7.30. If you've never been, I encourage you to come. We believe in prayer. We believe in God's healing touch upon mankind. Let me pray with you this morning. Father God, we just worship you and glorify your precious name. We know, Lord, that you're closer to us than a brother. We know that you were so close to us. And we marvel at the way that you bring about your purposes, how you include us in that work. And even when we do mess up, Lord, we know that you're there to forgive and to draw us back into your ways. And we just thank you now, Lord. In your precious and most glorious name's sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.